Our Father in heaven, how wonderful and glorious you are, and we come before you giving you thanks, giving you thanks for this beautiful day that you've provided for us, and giving you thanks for being our God and our Creator. We're thankful for the opportunity that we have to study and learn from your word. We pray that we'll be able to take lessons from, the, from your writings and be able to apply them to our, our lives so that we can grow closer to you. We pray that you'd be with those that, that have been sick and, and those that are recovering. We pray that you'd continue to be with them and, and help them to grow stronger. We pray that you'd be with those that are traveling and give them a safe journey. We pray that you'd continue to watch over us and bless us. Be with our nation. We pray, Lord, that you would be with our leaders, that they would make decisions that would be in accordance with your will. And we pray that you would, you would allow us the privilege of being able to still worship you without fear and without persecution. For we know there's many places in the world where this still happens. Pray that you would give us courage courage to share your word with our neighbors, with our friends, with our family, with those around us so that they too can, can share in the hope that we have. We pray that you'd be with us when we stumble. Help lift us up so that we can continue to, to serve you. Pray that we would put anything that, that keeps us from you behind us so that we can have that eternal home with you in heaven when this life is over. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're in Chronicles. What do we know about Chronicles? What is Chronicles about? History. History of who? Israel. It's the history of the, the nation of Israel. Now we, we left off last week with the death of David. So David is passed on and who's, who's coming up to rule in this place? Solomon. So let's go ahead and get started there. Second, Second Chronicles, verse one, chapter one, verse one it says, Solomon, the son of David, established himself in his kingdom, and the Lord his God was with him and made him exceedingly great. Verse two, it says, Solomon spoke to all Israel, to the commanders of thousands and of hundreds and to the judges and all the leaders in Israel the heads of fathers' houses. So we see, that, we see that he's gathered up the leaders of the nation, hasn't he? And so what do you think he's gonna do with these folks? In, in verse three, it tells us, Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the high place that was at Gibeon for the tent of meeting of God, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness was there. So what is it that was at Gibeon that was so important? The tabernacle. Now where was the Ark of the Covenant at this time? The covenant, the, the Ark was in Jerusalem. So what we have here is, um, yeah, let me find it. We have Jerusalem right here. Gibeon is outside of Jerusalem. It's not on this map, but this was a this was the quickest map I could find for that showed this. So Gibeon is is outside of Jerusalem. So Solomon has taken all these leaders from Jerusalem and they've gone over here to Gibeon to um, to where the tabernacle was. Um, in Second Chron in the next verse there it says, but David had brought up the ark of God from carrieth Jerem to the place that David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem. So he had a tent for the Ark of the Covenant, it just was not the tabernacle. So they went to the tabernacle. Verse five, it tells us, moreover, the bronze altar that Beazel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, had made was there before the tabernacle of the Lord. And Solomon, and the assembly, notice what it says there, sought it out. So what does it mean to so, that they sought it out? They were looking for it. They were specifically going for a purpose. Verse six, it says, Solomon went up there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tent of meeting. And what did he offer there? 
1,000 burnt offerings. That's a lot of burnt offerings, isn't it? Now, we didn't see any many references to David going and making offerings there at the tabernacle, but we see that we see Solomon's doing it, and he's doing it. Why a thousand? Any idea? <laughs> nice round number. Okay, it's possibly trying to make amends, maybe. In 1 Chronicles 27, in verse 29, it talks about how that over the herds that pastured in, Sh in Sharon was Shatari, Sh or Shitri, the, the Sharonite, over the herds of the valleys was Shaphath, the son of, Ed, 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 <laughs> sorry for the names here, Adlai. And then it, in verse 31, it says, all those were stewards of King David's property. Now, David had set up a kingdom, hadn't he? And he had been blessed. He had a lot of land. He had a lot of, a lot of things. And so it's possible that perhaps this thousand uh, burnt offerings was to show the prosperity of what God had given the nation here. And so Solomon was acknowledging that through his, I mean, thousand, that's a lot of burnt offerings to do. Also, get the idea that Solomon has a zeal for God. He's wanting to do this for God. It talked about him seeking out this place to actually do this. He, he went there with purpose. He went there with a desire. So he, he had this zeal for God. Now, could it be that Solomon might have also wanted to get God's attention? Do we sometimes reach a point in our life where we want God's attention? And so we might do something a little out of the ordinary to, to maybe, maybe God will listen to me or maybe God will pay attention to me. Let's see what he says here in, in, in the next few verses. Beginning in verse 7 of Second Chronicles 1, it says, In that night God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask what I shall give you. You ever wished God would just say, Ask of me what you want, right? That would be great, wouldn't it? Listen to what Solomon said. He said, you've shown great and steadfast love to David, my father, and have made me king in his place. O Lord God, let your word to David, my father, be now fulfilled, for you have made me a king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me now wisdom and knowledge to go out and come in before this people, for who can govern this people of yours which is so great? We've all heard this, right? Solomon was the guy who asked for wisdom, wisdom to rule these people. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Moses. Do you remember Moses' reaction to ruling the people? If you're not gonna help me, take me now. <laughs> you know, he was, he was having a hard time ruling these people. But we see now that those prophecies have been fulfilled. There's numerous people and as, as Solomon said here, numerous as the dust of the earth. This is a great nation. He's acknowledging that this nation is God's and that he was appointed to be king by God. And so he's looking for wisdom and knowledge. Let's look at God's response there in the next couple of verses. Verse 11, he says, because this was in your heart and you've not asked possessions, wealth, honor, or the life of those who hate you, and have not even asked long life, but have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may govern my people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you. I will also give you riches, possessions, and honor, such as none of the kings who had, who had, who had who were before you, and none after you shall have the like. So we see that God is saying what here? I'll give you this wisdom. He's going to give him this wisdom. Why? Because it was something that was beneficial to the people. Something beneficial to him. Now, what else did he say he would give him? 
wealth, long life, you know, and he would, you know, defeat his en enemies, things like that. You know, we, we have these books. We have First Chronicles, Second Chronicles. This Second Chronicles is kind of the beginning of the golden age of Israel, isn't it? The golden age of Israel. Look at, we're going to be reading about the great things that, that Israel is, is getting out of, out of the kingdoms here. Um, just as kind of a side note, First Second Chronicles falls where in our Bible? About the middle of the Old Testament, right? Do you know where Chronicles is in the Jewish Bible? It's, it's the last. It's the last book. Why do you think that is? It's reminding the people, isn't it, of the great things that God has done. That's what we're seeing in these books of First and Second Chronicles. We see God making promises. We see God fulfilling promises. And so there's a lot of hope in these books. And so with it, with it ending on that, because what's the, what's the next event after the end of, of the Old Testament? The coming of his son, right? The fulfillment of, of many prophecies that he's made there. So let's look at verses 14 to 17 here of Second Chronicles. It says, Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen who he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. That's a lot of chariots, isn't it? So we see that Solomon was able to, to have a great army. We see that he's, you know, he's, he's got all these things going for him. It says in verse 15, it says, And the king made silver and gold as common in Jerusalem as stone. Think about that. Gold and silver was everywhere. I mean, that, it, was, it wasn't something that was sought out. It was everywhere. So we see that uh, gold, and, gold and silver were common as stone. It also says, and he made cedar as plentiful as the sycamore of Sh Shephelah. Sycamore. What, what's the difference between a cedar and a sycamore? What do we know of, of cedar? Expensive. Pardon? Expensive. It was it was something to build with too, wasn't it? You don't hear much things, many things being made out of sycamore. Sycamore is a, uh, I wouldn't say a weed, but not not quite a desired tree. Maybe like our cottonwoods provide some things, like shade, but but not a very good building material. So we see that cedars were as plentiful as the sycamore. It says uh, in verse 16, And Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt and Kew, and the king's traders would buy them from Kew for a price. They imported a chariot from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. Why do you think these numbers are being thrown out there? Do we have any idea what, how much money we're talking for some of these things? Money's hard. I, I tried to find a, uh, a way to explain it that would help us to relate to it. Basically, a, a shekel, let's see, um, it ends up that 600 shekels of silver is about a half year's worth of labor for someone, for, for what someone would make. So that's pretty expensive. It's a pretty expensive chariot. And remember, it says that he had like 1,400 of these. So he had a lot of those. So we see that it was expensive. And where did he get them from? Got them from Egypt, didn't he? Got them from Kew. What, what, what's the idea of a, a Roman chariot? Well, remember that Rome, I'm sorry, Egyptian chariot. The, the Egyptians had been a p pretty powerful nation, hadn't they? And so this idea of a chariot is a military um, weapon that was pretty state of the art for its time. In fact, in the next, the next um, 
line there it says likewise through them these were exported to all the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Syria so this was top quality top quality stuff Solomon was able to get all these things and to have all these things now what is it that Solomon had that the Hittites and, and Syrians didn't have they had God that's right Anybody have any comments or questions? How did the Israelites were supposed to have chariots? Well, they weren't at one time. That is correct. But remember when the when God relented to letting the children of Israel have a king, it was told them that there would be things that they would have to that they would sacrifice in doing that. It would be like, okay, if you if you want a king to be like the nations around you, you're going to have to pay taxes, you're going to have to give, um, you know, provide labor, you're going to have to um, provide food, you're going to have to do all the support for them. And so part of that was raising an army where before, um, you know, armies are raised as needed type thing. With a king, the king actually had, as it said here, chariot cities where there was troops that were stationed and so they were that that made it a little bit different yes You know, I'm not real sure. I mean, uh, I think that what we're seeing here is that, that it's, with the mention of the Hittites and the Syrians, we do know that there were, the, the Syrians definitely come in later on in history. But um, yeah, I, I'm not sure on that. I, I, Right, and remember when we read back in uh, First Chronicles when David took a census, and and God didn't want him to do that. You know, there was there, he took a census for what purpose? To, to see the strength of his army, right? And and so he was he was punished for that, wasn't he? Good point. I I don't I'm not sure what to say to that. We we do see that he raised an army. We do see that he uh, had chariot cities. You know, it was like, um, as we go on in the life of Solomon, we'll see his kingdom grow, we'll see it strengthen, we'll see the boundaries enlarge, but we also see that there's less war, right? There's not a whole lot of war. Is it a peace through strength thing or, or what? I don't, I'm not sure on that. Any, any other comments? That's a good point. Let's go ahead and go into the second chapter here. Second chapter, verse one, it says, Now Solomon purposed to build a temple for the name of the Lord and a royal place for himself. Now who originally wanted to build the temple? David. Why couldn't David build the temple? God told him he couldn't, right? Because he had too much blood on his hands. And we talked about that in a couple of previous classes, that, that he was told that Solomon would build that temple for him. So what we see here is it says Solomon purposed to build the temple. So this is kind of like how he sought something out. He's, he's now going to, he has a purpose now, and he's going to build the temple. Verse 2, it says, Solomon assigned 70,000 men to bear burdens and 80,000 to quarry in the hill country and 3,600 to oversee them. Wow, that's quite a workforce, isn't it? That's a big workforce. Because what does it say they're doing here? Going to build a temple and going to build what? A, a palace, basically, for Solomon. All right, uh, the next few verses here, it says, and Solomon sent word to Hiram, the king of Tyre. 
Hiram, king of Tyre. Have we read about him before? Who, who else did business with Hiram? David. And for what purpose? Get material to build the temple, right? He started getting, getting cedars from them and things like that. So now what we're seeing here in, in Second Chronicles is we see that all that preparation that David did to, do the, to build the temple of God is now about to happen. So uh, he sent word to, H to Hiram, the king of Tyre, as you dealt with David my father and sent him cedar to build himself a house to dwell in, so deal with me. Behold, I'm about to build a house for the name of the Lord my God and dedicate it to him for the burning of incense of sweet spices before him and for the regular arrangement of the showbread and for burnt offerings morning and evening on the Sabbaths and on the new moons and the appointed feasts of the Lord our God as ordained forever for Israel. So he's telling him the purpose of doing this. He's doing it for who? for God. He's doing this all for God. He says in verse 5, the house that I'm to build will be great, for our God is greater than all gods. But who is able to build him a house, since heaven and even highest heaven cannot contain him? Good point, isn't it? God can't be contained in a building. And so he, he, he acknowledges that. And he says, who am I to build a house for him, except as a place to make offerings before him? Now, based on what we read earlier, Solomon knows about making offerings, doesn't he? He made an offering of a thousand burnt offerings. That's a lot of offerings. And so the purpose of this, of this temple was for what? Making offerings to God. It wasn't that God was, could be contained in that temple. It's so that the people could have a place to, to serve God to make these offerings. Verse 7, he says, So now send me a man skilled to work in gold, silver, bronze, and iron, and in purple, crimson, and blue fabrics, trained also in engraving, to be with the skilled workers who were with me in Judah and Jerusalem, whom David my father provided. Remember, this is kind of going back to what David had done. David had gathered all this material, he'd gathered workers, he'd, he had organized the Levites and the tasks that they would do. Solomon's starting to follow through on some of those things. Not only is he looking for a, a skilled craftsman, to build this temple, he wants that craftsman to train his men so that they can, they can continue in that work. Verse 8, he says, Send me also cedar, cypress, and algum timber from Lebanon, for I know that your servants know how to cut timber in Lebanon, and my servants shall be with your servants. Again, timber. I mean, that, that's what it takes to build stuff, right? David used cedars in Lebanon. Now, I have this map up here because up in this area, here's Lebanon, okay? Remember, it says that Hiram's up here from Tyre. Jerusalem's way down here. So there's, there's quite a distance there. <coughs> um. Again, he's looking for, for servants of Hiram to help his workers, to train his workers, so that, they can, so that they can also help with this work. Verse 9, it says, To prepare t timber for me in abundance, for the house I am to build will be great and wonderful. And then he says, I will give your servants, the woodsmen who cut timber, 20,000 cores of crushed wheat, 20,000 cores of barley, 20,000 baths of wine, and 20,000 baths of oil. So what we're seeing here is a contract, aren't we? we? We see this contract between who? Between Solomon? Between Hiram. So, there, you know, Hiram was a king of, of, of Tyre, and Solomon king of Jerusalem, you know, of, the, of Israel. So they're, they're working out arrangements here. 
verse 11 it says um, then Hiram the king of Tyre answered in a letter that he sent to Solomon he says because the Lord loves his people he's made you king over them Hiram also said blessed be the Lord God of Israel who made heaven and earth who has given King David a wise son who has discretion and understanding who will build a temple for the Lord and a royal place for himself so Hiram is acknowledging God isn't he he do you think he he knew God probably from dealing with David before because David David wasn't shy about praising God about identifying who God was so Hiram Hiram acknowledges these things about God he says now I've sent a skilled man who has understanding Huram Abi the son of a woman of the daughters of Dan and his father was a man of Tyre so this idea of Dan and Tyre up here is is an area of Dan and it's not far from Tyre so we see that this is this is someone that uh, has ties to both Tyre and Israel He, he also says that he is trained to work in gold, silver, bronze, iron, stone, and wood, and in purple, blue, and crimson fabrics, and fine linen, and to do all sorts of engraving and execute any design that may be assigned with him, assigned him with your craftsmen, the craftsmen of my Lord David, your father. Again, mentioning what David had done. David had gathered up these people to help him in this task, and so... Solomon starting to use these people to, to do this task. And then in verse 15, he says, Now therefore the wheat and barley, oil and wine of which my Lord has spoken, let him send to his servants, and we will cut whatever timber you need from Lebanon and bring it to you in rafts by sea to Joppa so that you may take it up to Jerusalem. Quite a journey there. Tyre down to Joppa. So they're... How are they transporting all this, all these cedars? Rafts, possibly making them into rafts so that they'll float and keep them together. So, so Hiram's arranging to get them down here, and then what's he saying Solomon needs to do? Yeah, he needs to get, go from Joppa to Jerusalem with them, doesn't he? Okay, any comments on, on that? Yes, Mike. I'm always fascinated by the skilled craftsmen in the story. And just because, you know, you see people that just have an amazing skill in something, and it was like a blessing from God where they never really had to work at it that hard, but they were so good at it. And I often wonder, like, did God just bless this skilled individual and then he taught everybody else? Or had he just worked through the trades and so it just fascinates me in there that, um, you know, that he would send for these, these skilled craftsmen. Yeah. Where did he get that from? Yeah, the skilled craftsmen. And what I find amazing is it's not just one thing. Right. It's not like he's just good in woodworking. He's not just good in stone carving. He's good in all these things, and engraving and, and forming and all of that. Dondi. He did, and and it did say, it did say moved by the Spirit for there. It it didn't mention it here. I'm not sure. I don't. I'm not. I did not look up the other uh, records of building the temple, but but we do see that that there was. He kind of outsourced this, you might say. He he sent to Tyre, saying, "Send me your best. Send me your best guy, to to do this." Because uh, you know just as kind of a side note here Tyre was its own pretty impressive city it was not a you know there was no slouch with with Tyre and so um, maybe it was the reputation of Tyre maybe it was because um, he knew David had dealt with King Hiram you know something something he he knew to ask for help from Hiram perhaps under the instruction of, of God or under the instruction of, of David to do that.
from Tyre to Joppa, 20 miles is about that. What is it? Okay, so about 88 miles. Okay, so so that that's a fair that's a fair amount of uh, space to to cover and uh, on on logs, right? And then I'm guessing from Joppa to Jerusalem, um, 30 miles, maybe. <laughs> so, so that you know, so hauling it to that point and, and doing it, so that's a that's a lot. Let's go ahead and go to the seventeenth verse. It says here that then Solomon counted all the resident aliens who were in the land of Israel, after the census of them that David his father had taken, and there were found one hundred and fifty three thousand six hundred. This is kind of interesting because remember that census is what David got in trouble for, wasn't it? But we see that, they, that, that Solomon's using some of that information, isn't he? These, these resident aliens, who might they be? Well, it was for counting the children of Israel. But in this, it's part of that census. I imagine they were counting who wasn't who were who were not the the children of Israel and so these resident aliens are those are who pardon those who aren't Israelites let's let's go back to uh, Joshua chapter 9 Joshua chapter 9 remember Joshua went in and led, led the armies that, that went in and conquered this land of Israel. And so it says, when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they on their part acted with cunning and went and made ready provisions and took worn out sacks for their donkeys and wineskins and worn, worn and torn and mended. Does this f sound familiar? Can anyone tell me what else happened in this? They basically lied and faked that they had come from far, far, far away. Right. So they deceived Joshua, right? And if we look at, uh, it, well, in verse 6, they said, We've come from a distant country, so now make a covenant with us. They were looking for a covenant for what purpose? So they wouldn't be destroyed, right? That's what happened to Jericho and Ai. They were, they were destroyed. Um, verse 14 of Joshua chapter 9 says, So the men took some of their provisions, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. That was a big mistake, wasn't it? I mean, we, we see that in Joshua's dealing with conquering the, the land, he often consulted the Lord, but what we see here is he didn't this time. Why didn't they take counsel of the Lord? What did they believe? They looked at these provisions. They looked at their stuff. They were told that it was new when they started. The bread was warm when it came out. You know, it was just fresh out of the oven when they left. The wineskins were, were new. So it says, you know, that the men took, they looked at the provisions and said, oh, these guys must have traveled a long way, right? But they didn't seek counsel from the Lord. It says, and Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live, and the leaders of the congregation swore to them. So this was a, this was a binding covenant, right? Verse 17 says, and the people of Israel set out and reached their cities on the third day. Oh, they weren't so far away, were they? Remember, they were in the area over here by Jericho. Uh, right here -ish. They were in that area, so only a few days away. Remember, where, where was it that, uh, that the uh, tabernacle was at? Gibeon, right? Who are these guys? The Gibeonites. So, so we see that 
they weren't, they weren't that far from Jericho to Jerusalem. Maybe less than 20 miles, I'm guessing. So, third day, uh, uh, people of Israel set out and reached their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, Chephira, Beroth, and kiriath Jerem. But the people of Israel did not attack them because the leaders of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. Then all the congregation murmured against the leaders. So the people knew it was wrong. And the leaders here were kind of paying the price, weren't they? Verse 19, it says, But the leaders said to the congregation, We've sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we may not touch them. This we will do to let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath that we swore to them. To the leader, and the leaders said to them, Let them live. So they became cutters of wood and drawers of water for all the congregation, just as the leaders had said of them. I think that might be some of those uh, resident aliens, some of those that were amongst them and became their servants. Now, servants here is probably a kind word for what? Probably slaves, right? Because these people were, these people were made to do menial tasks that the, that the children of Israel then didn't have to do. I mean, gathering wood, drawing water, that, that's hard work. That's, that's something that they were having to do. And just in, in verse 22, it says, Why did you deceive us, saying we're far from you? And they answered in verse 24, it says, Because it was told to your servants for a certainty that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you and did this thing. And now behold, we are in your hand. Whatever seems good and right in your sight to, to do to us, do it. So they were grateful. They were grateful just to have their lives. Reminds me of... Uh, certain faith of someone in Jericho, doesn't it? You know, when, when, the, when, the pe when the children of Israel came to Jericho, what, what was it that, uh, that was said of them? We know your God is with you, and we're scared. Now, remember the children of Israel had been wandering in the desert for 40 years. The, the, the rumors or, or the... Uh, what had happened to Egypt was still circulating. These people were afraid. These Gibeonites, they knew the story. They knew that, they knew that Moses was, was told that he would get all this land from, from their God. And so they were scared. So anyway, the, that seems to be who those resident aliens may be. Oh, yes. So, so it was those that weren't those weren't the uh, Israelites, Dondi. I always feel like, I mean, I know that nowadays if you made a contract and lied about it as making a contract, that would nullify it, like legally. So it's just interesting to me that a lie was able to hold them to a contract, and maybe it's not so much that. Yes. Even though it, it was underlying. Or hurtful, right? I mean, it's, look, look at the history of Israel. How well did Israel keep the covenant with God? I mean, isn't that what we're seeing in First and Second Chronicles? Is we're seeing what's been done over the history of the, the children of Israel? We see that we see that time and again, it wasn't God that let the people down. 
it was people that let God down. And so we see that. But what, what else do we see? What do we see about God? Faithfulness. Don't we also see what, what uh, when uh, Solomon, what Solomon said when, when God said, what shall I give you? He says, you have shown great and steadfast love. He showed it to David, but he also showed it to his people, didn't he? Because he didn't give up on his people. Now the people, remember this is after the period of the judges. Judges was a rough time. Not a good time for the history of the, of the nation of Israel. But what we're seeing here is we're seeing, we're seeing that the people are turning to God. We're seeing that a temple's being made to honor God. We're seeing that that temple was built for what purpose? To worship God, to make sacrifice to God. That's, that's what that's all about. So, gathered up these resident aliens and uh, we'd left off at Second Chronicles 2, verse 18. 70,000 of them he assigned to bear burdens, 80,000 to quarry in the hill country, and 3,600 overseers to make the people work. So that's a lot of people working in one area to build something. And uh, what they end up building is pretty amazing. All right, we'll go ahead and anybody have any other comments? Again, I'm filling in for Roger, so this was kind of a, I found out, I found this out last week in class, so. <laughs> you got voluntold. Voluntold, yep. Yeah. All right, any other comments? If not, let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to come together to, to study your word, to be uplifted and encouraged by, by one another here, most of all to be encouraged by you, by your word. For we know, God, that you have been there for us, that you've always been there. You've showed your steadfast love, your mercy. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to show that mercy upon us and that we would, we would know that through you all things are possible. We can overcome the things in this life that, that are difficult, those things that, that keep us from you. We pray that you'd be with us and give us the strength to, to get up when we're down, to follow you when it's difficult, and to know that, that the reward in heaven will make all this but a, but a faint memory. We pray that you'd be with us and watch over us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.